سبحان الله وانا خدي Bonjour, Bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour, Bonjour. 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 Good morning, Father Shallow. Good morning, yes. Good morning, Father. How are you? Fine, with you. Thank you, thank you for this inviting. Thank you, Father. Good morning, Father Shallow. Good morning, Father Shallow. Good morning, yes. How are you? Fine, fine. Thank you, thank you for this inviting. Thank yes. you, Father. <laughs> thank you for coming. Good morning, Father Shallow. Good morning, yes. How are you? Fine, fine. Thank you, thank you for this inviting. Thank yes. you, brother. <laughs> thank you for coming. Okay, Fadia Hello. Okay, Fadia Shalu. Eva. Hello. It's repeating. Bonjour, ça je t'ai déjà dit, je me suis entendu ma chérie. Bonjour, bonjour. Et c'est ça mon frère Glen. All right, il est là pour le show ça. But it's very low, eh? The sound is very low. Is that only my computer tia na sepe marche? Tia tia paf paf na tin sema. Uh, because it was t telling me something, dial in. I don't have to dial in. No check. Le, I'm in Wi Fi, Margaret. Uh, okay. Mr. Oh. All right, now I'm going to All right, thank you. Thanks. I'm going to go to on Facebook. I'm going to go to Facebook. I'm going to go to Facebook. Eva. For Cinema. You're going to go to Facebook. Okay, for Cinema, you're going to go to Facebook. 
naraw haba live streaming on Facebook. El Facebook. Ano pa nasa? Father Nicolaus, welcome. Thank you for being with us. We're having some difficulties with um, uh, connecting and streaming to Facebook. Although we're, we're, we're just fixing that at the moment. Thank you, dear Father. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, great. Let's hear Joy repeat, Sharno. Yes, great. Okay, so it's a Facebook problem. Okay. I will remove it and then we will upload it. Later. Um, okay. uh, we will upload it as a video. Yes. Okay. Okay. I think we're all set. Okay. I think we can we can start. Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you for, for being with us this morning. Um, where we shall um, have a look at a very important theme, um, the theme of discernment. The means for doing that is through a very, very beautiful text and a very fundamental text from the Orthodox Church, which is called the Philokalia. Um, I shall be introducing very, very briefly the theme, and then in real, I shall introduce for us the esteemed guest for us today. So in the 26th step of the letter of divine ascent, John Climacus opens by saying these words, discernment in beginners is true knowledge of themselves. In intermediate souls, it is spiritual sense that faultlessly distinguishes what is truly good from what is of nature and opposed to it. And in the perfect, it is the knowledge which they pass, which they possess by divine illumination and which can enlighten with its lamp what is dark in others. Or perhaps generally speaking, discernment is and is recognized as the assured understanding of the divine will on all occasions, in every place and in all matters. And it is only found in those who are pure in heart and in body and in mouth." Close quote. There is here a clear path that opens before us when we decide to embark on the spiritual journey a path of knowledge, not rational knowledge, but knowledge of the heart, understood here in the Philokalia as the seat of all that constitutes the human person in his or her existence. The path is clear, not in the sense that it's easily understandable or distinguishable from our shadow, to use a Jungian metaphor. The path is clear in its end result, put simply as life in God, hezekiah, stillness of the impassioned heart, and ultimately theosis, divine transformation. The sermon is at once a skill and a gift, a skill that must be honed in self-knowledge, as Klimako suggests to beginners, and right choices based on distinguishing the good from the bad, again, as Klimako suggests to intermediate souls. In fact, to discern is to weigh rightly, to have a right and proportional judgment of things. It is to tread lightly on the narrow path between knowledge of divine things on the one hand and knowledge of one's finite possibilities on the other. As I wrote in the invitation to this online lecture, discernment is the turning towards oneself with discretion and humility as the answer to God's turning towards us. In this light, the resulting spiritual journey is not one of judgments, but one of openness to read the signs of God's mercy and love within and for creation. 
Discernment is then also a gift bestowed on us by grace that opens our hearts for God's will. As Klimako suggests to perfect souls, the enlightened soul reaches an uninterrupted state of discernment or what he calls divine illumination. That is a source of light for those in the dark. The act of discerning is the act of acquiring experiential knowledge. Often fundamental spiritual questions are asked. What is the relation between the grace of God and human freedom? How is one to understand God's role in one's spiritual life? How is one able to distinguish God's grace from one's capacity and personality? Discernment implies then the capacity for self-introspection into one's thoughts, into one's inner movements, and the capacity, or lack thereof, to take decisions in line with one's own formed and informed conscience. The text which we shall be referring to today is the philokalia, literally meaning in Greek, the love of the good or else the love of the beautiful. The philokalia is a compilation of patristic texts from between the fourth and 15th centuries, which had remained until that time mostly unpublished. It was first published in Venice in 1782 in Greek. The compilation was carried out by two monks of the Holy Mount Athos, Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain and Saint Macarius of Corinth, with the intention of propagating a spirit of reform in Eastern monasticism and in the Orthodox Church in general. Delivering today's lecture, we have with us our esteemed guest, the very Reverend Professor Nicolaus Ludovicos. Father Nicolas studied psychology, pedagogy, philosophy, and theology at the universities of Athens, Thessaloniki, Paris at the Sorbonne, Institute Catholique de Paris, and St. Sergius Orthodox Theological Institute, and lastly also in Cambridge. He taught at the universities of Thessaloniki and Wales and he is currently Professor of Dogmatics and Christian Philosophy at the University Ecclesiastical Academy of Thessaloniki. He is also a visiting professor at the Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies at the University of Cambridge and at the University of Balamont, Lebanon, as well as a research fellow at the University of Winchester in the UK. He has given lectures at more than 30 universities around the world, he has published 19 books of dogmatics and philosophy and numerous articles translated in 10 languages. His last book in English is Analogical Identities, the Creation of the Christian Self Beyond Spirituality and Mysticism in the Patristic Era, published with Brepols in 2019. His last two books in Greek are The Open History and Its Enemies, The Rise of the Velvet Totalitarianism, published in Athens in 2020, and secondly, Unseen Harmony, a Metaphysical History of Ancient Greek Philosophy, published in Athens in 2021. His forthcoming book in English is Intermeaningfulness, Self-Catholicization and Christian Theology, with Brepo's uh, publishers. He is also the senior editor of Analogia, the Pemptosia Journal for Theological Studies, Father Nicolaus is a member of many scientific societies around the world, and he works in the intersection between theology, philosophy, and psychology in order to bring about both a criticism of the latter two and a contemporary interpretation and hermeneutics of the former. Father Nicolaus, I thank you deeply for accepting our invitation, and I um, invite you to um, deliver us your lecture. Thank you, dear Father. Thank you all for this <clears throat> opportunity for spiritual communication with this very interesting subject. Um, uh, Father Glenn has already made an introduction and a good introduction. And this allows me to go on with my own uh, comments about this uh, topic. And um, uh, that means that we'll be given the chance to discuss some issues of 
um, concerning this a very important thing, which is um, discernment. Uh, for me, uh, discernment, discernment that, that, that would be a, a preferable title for my presentation, perhaps. Discernment is the opposite to paranoia. Paranoia is not just a, a mental disease. It is perhaps also a way of human thinking, a way of understanding the world, or even sometimes of creating a philosophical ontology. I'm thinking perhaps on Hegel at this moment. Significant parts of the classical ontology at times smack of paranoia, that meaning an almost total absence of the sense that we need leave things talk to us before we decide that their nature, the, about their nature in an abstract and intellectual way. Because the things talk to us. This is, for example, what Heraclitus understood when he wrote that we have to listen, akusadas in Greek, to the world, or logos of the world, or to follow, not just to think of, to follow, episte, the logos. This is also what Maximus the Confessor understood much better when he said that the Logos, Christ, has a word, an intention, a loving will, thus creating another Logos or will, a created Logos will, and addressing it. This is what I call a dialogical reciprocity between the Logos, God the Logos, and the created uh, Logi, which is us, in a book of mine on, on Maximus the Confessor, Dialogical Reciprocity. Now, in order to proceed to this dialogue, one needs to listen carefully to discern the other's world, first of all. This is an anti-paranoia necessarily connected with metanoia, which is the Greek word for uh, repentance. In this sense, repentance means to start a real dialogue with a real other. And the beings, perhaps, of this world through discernment. And now we are, can enter the world of Philokalia. Here we see that connection, that the discernment is connected with humility. This is the first and most fundamental remark we can make if we read the Philokalic text. For example, Peter Damasin, in the third volume of Philokalia, writes that discernment is born from humility and leads us to discern divine will in everything that we need to do. Also, Elias, Elias the Presbyter, in the second volume of Philokalia, says that from our desire, from the truth and mercy of God, derives humility. Wonderful phrase. See his truth and mercy, and we become humble, which begets, which humility begets discernment, which discernment then leads us to God's truth. It's we discern God's truth. Uh, uh, much better in a second step. Perhaps the most important text in Philokalia, uh, at least in my view, is uh, uh, 
text we find in this who connects discernment, discernment with achieving love, achieving to love indeed. This is very, very important because it opens us to a sort of ontology. Ontology and reminds us of what I said about paranoia, which is precisely the final separation, the final re rejection of love, or a narcissistic imaginary love through a relationship that takes place in my mind only. So, Theodorus um, says that if we add uh, humility to absence, to, to humility to abstinence, we take impassibility. And when we add, when we when we proceed uh, through faith, we acquire knowledge from both, that means impassibility and knowledge, we take discernment, a sort of discernment that is connected with understanding the need of loving as a, 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 an existential and ontological characteristic, uh, reaching to love for, for all the other beings. That means, uh, we learn how to love through discernment. This is very important because in this sense, discernment ultimately means to create, create a real relationship of love with a real, the imagine, that is not the imaginary other, who is a, uh, narcissistic projection of me upon him through and by the everyday uh, uh, sadhu The everyday relationships are sadhu -masochistic. I take this from psychoanalysis, not in the sense of the well-known sexual perversion, of course, but in the sense that of the abolition or preclusion of both my real self and the others real self. Let's, let's explain this because the therapy to this has to do precisely with locally calls, calls humility. I abolish myself in order to conquer the other through, for example, my, through, for example, impressing him or submitting myself, pretending that I submit myself to him, or through flattering him, and always in order, in order to conquer him. And that means, of course, uh, all this violence that we call love. There is a, um, you know, love is always violent. There is um, a, a, a sermon of mine the YouTube in Greek uh, called Love is Violence, where I find 15 different things that we call love and they are not love. Love is the most violent thing in the world. And if it, even if it is something that is uh, godlike love, it is still violent with a different uh, sort, of, sort of violence, which passes from the mystery of the cross. Um, so I, I also abolish the other self by object, objectifying him as a, the prop of my narcissistic fulfillment. Now I'm rem I remember Lopezé Petit, Ah, petit a, according to Lacanian psychoanalysis, um, or the self object theory of the self object, according to Kohut's psychology, in the sense that I create a stone, a step stone for my narcissism through the other. It means I abolish myself 
my true self and the other's self at the same time. Uh, and then humility, and here we're entering the, the, the Christian ascetic theology, of course, opens us to the humble listening and understanding the other. Let's try to understand this. Humility in the philokalia means to know self as he really is. That is my inner conflicts, my unconscious perhaps woods, and finally my inability and unwillingness to accept myself without, of course, the disguise that is offered today through the Facebook, for example, and the mass media that allows me to uh, fantasize, allows me to create an imaginary uh, self that I can accept. Um, so, uh, humility means to understand this. Of course, humility in this sense, in Philokalia, comes out of gratitude. That is very important. Otherwise, that, that would lead me to depression. Out of gratitude, I'm loved without knowing the reason by God. God serves me, tolerates me, opens me chances, or gives me illumination, opens me the, 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 uh, the, the world of, eter of eternity. Though, although I am not worthy, I mean, in order to make me worthy. And the first reaction of this attitude, which is a very happy moment, out of gratitude, I become humble. <laughs> I see myself how I am really, and I see things that I could not tolerate, I could not accept to, 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 to see other ways. This is why psychoanalysis, I was a psychoanalyst, I started as a psychoanalyst, and I was athe atheist in that period of time. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very, very harsh, can be very harsh. Can be very harsh. You cannot love the other through psychoanalysis. And you are, don't allow, allow him to love you, at, at least in the classic classic psychoanalysis, the Freudian schools. So why? Uh, because you have to somehow uh, help you to acquire a certain knowledge, but what to do with this knowledge? This is what we need. A man who said in the depression, uh, if you just show him that, no, you, you have this depression because your mother uh, withdraw. Uh, I say an example now. If she had a son before you, this son died as a baby. She, she, she withdrew from this relation with you. And now she left you alone. And now you have this expression. What can I do with this knowledge? I cannot create a relationship with this knowledge. But with humility, this sort of humility out of gratitude, I can create a relationship, a deep relation, not only with God, but also with the others. This is the, 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 the happy part. And this is how I connect, for example, psychoanalysis with theology. Psychoanalysis and psychology in general is, is, is good for us to describe things. But when we come to the solutions, uh, I, I, I think that this uh, here starts a problem. So, in this sense, the humility, I also realize that I have distorted the others' will, the others' intentions, words, worlds, sentiments, according to my need of using them in this or that way. And in this way, humility, according to the many phenocardic authors, uh, begets discernment. This is why it begins the sermon, because I see clearly now. In the sense, first of all, Christ-centered and Christ-inspired understanding of my merciless, paranoid rejection of both my self and the other's true self, and this other can be even God himself, right? 
in this game of narcissistic conquering. And second, it begets discernment in the sense of according uh, and according to Theodorus, right? This is an achieving of true love, as we said above. That is true and deep communion. Communion. This was what we need discernment for. It's not just 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 a, just a, an individual individualistic, if you like, achievement. Another one that I, I add to my other achievements. I have also discernment. I have also discernment. No, it is a way of creating, indeed, um, something much deeper, and that is also connected with, it, with a crazy life, as I will say uh, uh, shortly. And it is precisely in this way that we can start talking about all the subsequent connotations of the sediment, such as those described, for example, by Peter Damasin in the third volume of Philokalia. Here, we leave indeed things talk to us in Christ, as I said about. And out of our love for God, or other, or the other, or out of love that is of the final truth of things, which is, which final truth is uh, love indeed. According to Peter Damasin, discernment in this sense is light, showing the real constitution of all things, of the self, of the other, of God's things, and of creation. In this sense, as Peter Damason writes, the sermon is, so shall the time, the enterprise, the work that we have to do, the power, the knowledge, the age, the possibility, the weakness, the proeresis, you know the Greek word proeresis, uh, what I want, I intend, deeply intent, the willingness, the fragmentation, the hexes, the aptitude, the habitude, the lack of knowledge, Buddhist power and quality, health and disease, the way of the place, the association, the bringing up, the faith, the mood, the purpose, the attitude, the permission, the science, the natural prudence, the haste, the wakefulness, the delay, and he says, etc. In a word, <laughs> discernment as a result of humility reveals the true nature of God's call to us. Through the others, through beings, through his providence, through scripture, through our his incarnation. A call that takes place in and through grace, and it is step by step formed through the revelation of the true meaning of the self and of all things in Christ. This is what we need in the incarnation for, in order to discover the true meaning of things in Christ. This is what this Chalcedon, the Synod, teaches us that everything which is human 
everything which is created is united with everything that, which is uncreated. So we have wills, two wills, energies, two energies. Everything is double in one hypothesis. So closely, so closely bound, huh? but there are still two. Two wills, two energies, creation and the creator in a so close connection. And that means that creation's truth is revealed in the uncreated connection. And that in this way, Christ is the truth of creation. That our truth, uh, this is why <laughs> all, all, all Christian theology is and has to be Christocentric. And this is why, I, as Father Glenn knows, I have a reservation about using the word spirituality. <laughs> when I was in Paris as a student in the Catholic Institute, the Catholic Institute, um, um, I remember a, a part of the library of the Institute more than 30 years ago it was called Pneumatech. 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 I could not understand it. I could not understand the word. But I could understand the meaning. So, but I would do, I did not want to ask my Catholic colleagues, what does this mean? Because it, 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 it was ob obvious that I had to know what the, that was the meaning of the word. Finally, I asked, what is this thing, Primatech? They said to me, don't you know about Primatech is the library with books of the books in spirituality concerned. What is spirituality then? I'll, <laughs> I'll read you some things about this in the end of this uh, presentation. So, um, so uh, in Christ, in this sense, the settlement is perhaps a fo the, the foremost Christological virtue. All virtues are Christological, of course, as we said, because, because of this hypostatic union, all, 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 all virtues are energies and, you know, two energies, two wills, God's will, human will, that we have a virtue. When we affirm this in our lives, we have virtue. So all, 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 all virtues are Christological, as we know. Uh, but it's the foremost Christological virtue since it help us, helps us understand, helps us orientate all things and attitudes and all what Peter Damason said about you know, everything toward living and understanding precisely things in Christ's way. To find an, an, an identity analogical to Christ and in Christ, um, I take the term from my last book in English, Father Glenn knows about this. Um, this analogical identity. <laughs> but that means that finally the sermon points to and leads us to the unification of all things in, in the mutual relationships, uh, moving uh, toward the final Christification in their final consubstantial unity. This is my another terminus technical that I use here, invented. Consubstantial unity, it means that, and it's taken from Maximus the Confessor, uh, that nature is fragmented. It's in fragmentation, this is our fall. Uh, as I said to my students, when they asked me, said that two, two men, two, two human, two, two men waiting for the bus in the bus station, uh, are they consubstantial? And they say, yes, they are, <laughs> but they are not. They are not. It's a similar nature. It's in logically thinking from the point of, or logical point of view. This is true, they're consubstantial. They have the same nature, but existentially, ontologically speaking, they are not consubstantial in the, in, in the way uh, 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 the Trinity is consubstantial. I use the term intergiveness of essence in order to describe how the essence is one. It's intergiven without time, out of time, pre-eternally. It is a given. It's one essence, but three, three persons. So this 
according to Maximus and the Areopagus, is transferred to creation through Christ. That means we, in, this, in this way, love becomes ontological of the church. I love the other in order to restore human nature because I'm a part of it. And through narcissism, which is the ascetic philoftia uh, in modern, in modern, modern, ish, modern way of describing it, a uh, modern version, uh, I separate more and more of this or, or, or already fragmented nature. And I take what it is needed for me in order to survive. And in this way, I have a, a wrong self, a non-true self, a false self, and in the way I describe, and we are saved from this through humility, which results to discernment. And I, 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 I uh, uh, distort my, destroy my selfhood and they set the other selfhood in order to use it as my, uh, you know, to fantasize this. Uh, finally, what? The will to power. This is why in this book, The Analogical Dentist, I create, I make a deep theological criticism of theology by opposing to the will to power, which is the Option, the final, the final option, the consummation of the Platonic, always Platonic metaphysics, uh, philosophical physics, on the other, on one hand, and the will to consubstantiality on the other, which comes from the depth of, depth of Christianity, spiritual depths. So, um, it, as I mentioned, the book, my book, uh, this logical identities. I want just to read what is this analogical identity in a sense in order to make this clear. Thus, theologically speaking, we have an analogical identity. Each time we change through synergetic relationship, remember, Karsidon, involving participation. Each time we reorientate our will toward the restoration of the unity of the fragmented created nature in us and outside us. And in a sense, we become new aspects, each one of us, of this unity. We become new aspects of this unity, each one of us. That is, we have an analogical identity when we analogically imitate divine will or energy in its exceptional activity to unite created beings in new and even deeper ways of unification in new and even richer forms of either meaningfulness. This is the title of my next, next book, so I cannot explain this to you now. <laughs> Giving and having meanings now through the, the one for the other, through the other, I can say, but it's not the whole one, only that. Changing through analogy is the very human essence. You see that how through the seven week enter in you know enter ontology eh? because we the true nature of things is revealed to us which is thus a di dialogical essence uh, an essential hypothesis always in becoming through dialogue. dialogue dialogue with god dialogue with the others embracing all creation and being realized through each analogical will to consubstantiality as i said this kind of analogical identity is an open identity, always new, always coming, always richer, always moving toward the accomplishment of new and deeper modes of consubstantiality. We see that how uh, uh, wonderful is this, this, this perspective that is open to us through and by uh, um, uh, Christian theology. Um, so the sermon is precisely the way we proceed in order to understand the work of divine will in this world, in order to imitate, participate in it. Thus, there exists also an unconscious
an ecclesiological aspect of the synod too, as I said. And uh, all this has to do directly with ontology rather than um, merely with spirituality. Ecclesiological, because all this happens in, in ecclesia, in the church. This is, this reveals us the mystery of the church, which is the mystery of, the mystery of discerning God's will for all beings. And uh, uh, in order to say something about spirituality, uh, I promised that I will do another paragraph of the same book. I have a reservation, you know, about calling life in Christ, life in Christ as we're calling it spirituality. Most of the modern briefly definition of Christian spirituality that I know, I know, put emphasis in relevant parts of Christian life, like uh, an ethical faith, Woods is the author, the transcending character of all human persons, Sir Drake, our basic attitudes, self-life and activity, our lived experience, and spirituality is our lived experience and the disciplined life of prayer and action, says another Don Salius or even the whole person in the totality of existence of, in the world, according to Steve Fellow. I do not doubt that all the above, along with other similar aspects, form parts of our life in Christ, but they have little to do with ontology. The ontology of the radical transformation to this uh, communion, will to will, energy energy nature with nature can be uh, can understood that decisively beyond spirituality in any philosophical or theological definition of it, since it represents the absolute act of God in Christ to recreate things through changing their mode of existence and making them divine by grace and thus infinitely, infinitely extending the incarnation event as the resurrection of nature, which starts already now. This is catalogical ontology, though not without ethical or social repercussions. Described in a previous book of mine as ontology of dialogical reciprocity is also the way to describe the church as an, in ontological terms. As the ultimate telos and meaning of creation, which creation is in this way an analogical creation, i.e., as I wrote recently, now I'm referring to another book of mine in English uh, called Church in the Making, an ecclesiology of consubstantiality, which is published with St. Vladimir's Blessing in the US. And I, here is what I wrote I, I, I there. The absolute loving freedom of God manifested in his pre-eternal loving will, this is the analogical creation, the absolute loving freedom of God <coughs> manifested in his pre-eternal loving will to spread his mode of existence upon nothingness. This is what the church is, to spread the mode of existence of God upon nothingness, which is just brilliant. <coughs> so you see how far uh, this concept of discernment leads us. It leads us to God's plan about uh, the, the world and about us and how to discern it, how to discuss, how to, 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 to discern this, this, this uh, uh, ever, ever happening uh, event. How much time do we have? Do I have? Um, maybe 10 minutes. Oh, wonderful. Because I can, also turn to the meaning of discernment for uh, the modern, what I call, velvet totalitarianism. <laughs> it's a book of mine uh, published in Greek. I hope that will, it's been translated by, by good by, in English. But I hope that will be appear also in English. The, the title is um, The Open History of Its Enemies. And the subtitle is, you see, how, how deeply can, can theology affect philosophy? How deeply? I mean, 
and, 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 and psychology. It's like I, 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 I'm all, all these things together. I, that happened not because I planned it, because it just happened. I started from psychology and then pedagogy, then trying to find out what's, what's going on. I had two, two grave problems with, with psychology. The one is what to do with narcissism. Psychology cannot tell us. Narcissism is the oxygen of, of, of our souls. If you take all the oil, you, the, the narcissism, we, we will die from the depression. But on the other time, it kills us. Mm -hmm. This is the, uh, a weapon that we have against ourselves. So what is the limit? How can I say that I need this portion of narcissism, love the others as yourself? That means you have, you are free um, to, 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 to somehow have this uh, part of narcissism, this, 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 this sum of narcissism. But, but on the other hand, it is narcissism which is killing my love for the others. You see, a psychology cannot say how and how and what is possible to do with uh, you, and the answers uh, start from let's abolish it or let's accept it. Freud let's, let's says that the secondary narcissism has to be abolished. Koch says that we have to accept it. Please use me and I'm going to use you. <laughs> this is realistic, this is what Koch says. Make me yourself subject. I'll make yourself you myself subject in order to to I mean to fantasize it and to create you know. So this is the one problem, and the second problem is what is the end of analysis? What sort of man do we have? Do do we want to create? When can I say that I'm I'm sound psychologically sound this moment? I am sound. You know, I don't have any problem. No, no, no psychological disease. This, this moment, I, I'm, I'm absolutely healthy. No, we don't have. This is why I uh, switched to philosophy in order to find out. Huh? And finally, <laughs> I switched to theology, where I think that I found answers. But uh, we have to be, uh, to respect this. You know, there's not answers that, you know, we, the priests, are the, the destroyers of the truth sometimes. But we preach easily the same thing, but we don't understand here and there. Um, you have to live with these things. Too. It's a cross to, 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 to see yourself through these things and, and be humble and, and, you know, and uh, see what God wants to do with all these things and then share these things with others in order to uh, understand them better yourself and, 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 and what is the most important to walk this path yourself walk this path, not just to address uh, pure, poor students and, <laughs> and lead, guide them to write their dissertations. So, um, uh, what is the value of totalitarianism? Um, I could say that on the level of ethics, it means, first of all, lack of discernment, mm. theologically speaking. In favor of this, First, postmodern emotivism. You know what emotivism? You know Alastair McIntyre's work, for example, huh? which was a great philosopher and again a very good Catholic. Uh, and um, he realized precisely this that we cannot uh, have uh, ontological um, uh, foundations for ethics anymore. We cannot create but private ethics, mm. private ethics. This is my ethics, my private ethics. This is my. Why is this true? No, it's not true. It's just what I like. And then even God becomes what I like. And the good, of course, is what I like. And it is good because I like it. So this is what emotivism has uh, turned finally to be. And for, this, of course, favorizes absolutely the world to power. Because what I like, I have to claim this from you. And if you're weaker, if I, if I have better weapons, so, you know, it's, even, it's, it's, it's happens in politics, as you know. I'm stronger, so I can do what I like. You're the weakest. So it is impossible for you to 
do what you like. I exercise my will to power. You cannot exercise your will to power. I can be an emotivist. You cannot be an emotivist. This is the, the, the tragedy because uh, I was in a, in, a, in, a, in a philosopher's conference some days ago, and they were talking about autonomy. The autonomy and autonomy and autonomy and <laughs> political philosophers. Said, what is autonomy? What is, you know, Putin's autonomy and, you know, the Ukrainian's autonomy? You know, they are all autonomous, but the stronger, you know, is the, the one who is really autonomous because, you know, he just uh, pro projects his, his, his power upon the, upon the other, and the other become, becomes heteronomous, uh, both Greek words, autonomous, autos, autonomous, and heteronomous, heteronomous. You know, the other is, is weaker, so he becomes heteronomous. Where, where, where is the autonomous? Who is autonomous in, the, in, 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 in our, uh, you know, in our world at this moment? Who is, uh, uh, first of all, allowed to decide for himself? Indeed, in Christ, in the church, you are allowed to decide for yourself. Still, perhaps is the last place where you are left to make mistakes, and you are accepted, though you are making mistakes that you don't understand, you don't understand precisely everything. You are, you know, you repent, you don't repent, you stop repenting, you know, you, you, you start re repenting again, you see things you know, and God always loves you. This is why uh, great um, Byzantine, father, Byzantine father, Nicholas, Kavasilas, Kavasilas, you know, all, uh, you know, founded all the ethical life, the, the ethical life, built all the, the ethical, his ethical life, upon gratitude, gratitude and friendship. My gratitude and friendship. So this is why one becomes a monk. This is why one becomes an I'm not a monk. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, admired, I, I, I admired, like, very much monasticism. And monks were my first teachers in Christianity. And precisely because they dedicate themselves to this discernment of things of God in this, in this, in this, in this strange world, and uh, we see that in uh, I cannot, you know, my book on totalitarianism is this one. You see, it's a very good uh, front page, front uh, cover. So, <laughs> and I cannot, you know, transfer the, what I say in this book as some 360 pages uh, in, 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 in this lecture. But the meaning is precisely this, that the modern man does not want to discern anything. There's nothing to discern. He just copies his own, you know, desires and creates what I called, I call, I cannot translate it in English. In, 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 in Greek, we have what, uh, uh, Greek language is more flexible. Uh, it's the, an imaginary subject, mm -hmm. but it's not just an imaginary. It's, it's, it, it is becomes the subject of his, his imagination, the creator of his imagination. And this is absolutely affirmed. This is absolutely normal in, in, in our times. So you see that the couples cannot have a real relation because they fantasize instead of seeing the other. They don't have a real relation with, with their children. They don't have a relation with, 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 with society. Modern man, you know, withdraws at the very same moment. He thinks that he understands everything. And this is, has uh, uh, make a, a, a great, you know, change in the very essence of narcissism today. We have narcissism even without pleasure. Without pleasure, as I said in my in my Cambridge, perhaps you, you had uh, Father Glenn heard about this. Uh, in in the sense that uh, even if I have pleasure, you know, if even if I don't have pleasure, I exercise narcissism because it's the only way to understand relationship. Everything is taking place in my mind here. I'm in relationship with you, but. This relationship is, is not a relationship with the you, you as you are, but as I create you in my in my mind. I I I, I fantasize about you in, in my mind. 
So it is the opposite of discernment. And the end of this can be said that it is paranoia. In, in, uh, in this book, I, I, access, uh, I, I try to, to find out how um, uh, uh, it is a criticism of, 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 of the Enlightenment, first of all. I, I try to see how Hegel, I start uh, by, by trying to find out, find out how Hegel read Aquinas. Mm. It created this horrible story of the Logos speaking in me and through me. You know, but when I, 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 when, when I claim this, when I say that the Logos is talking through me and he needs me in order to talk, that means that when I talk, the Logos talks. We see, you see, it's the opposite, precisely the opposite of, of, of the biblical, you know, understanding of logos. Mm -hmm. And then we have enlightenment. There are some good aspects of enlightenment, but many other things uh, can be dangerous and have led to contradictions, which we're not analyze perhaps in a next meeting, or I don't know, in the future. But thank you for your uh, attention and goodwill. And uh, we can stop here and uh, I can listen to you. Thank you, Father. I think it's safe to conclude that your passion um, is, I, I think, impassions us as well. What I'm feeling at this moment, um, I think my first, my first reactions um, upon hearing this beautiful reflection, I think it's, it's very, very important to remember that it's very easy when we look at the other, we look at them um, through the filter of my expectation of them, my, um, as you say, my fantasy of them, my, um, I always look at them through, through the lens of myself. Um, I think discernment, that is why it makes sense that we, we started by discussing humility first because it is the act first, the act of humility, which um, makes me realize that what I am looking at or rather who I am looking at is another person and is another um, I, is another ego, is another identity. It's another self um, in their own world. I think it's um, this beautiful act and this very important first step in uh, becoming becoming really available to to look and to listen rather than to fantasize and to sort of create this this um as you say this paranoia to paranoia is li quite literally is this making up of this this reality um making up of reality that you think is real um and how how subtle it is when that is not um overtly problematic in the sense that, you know, it's, it doesn't involve psychosis and as such, but how much more dangerous it, it is when it's, it is so subtle that it filters through just normal friendships, just normal relationships and the way I see you and the way I, you know, what I expect from you. Um, I think, I think that is, I think that is the very, very, it, touch, it touches me very deeply to, really behold you as you um, uh, and not you as my expectation of you. Um, I think secondly, with, with regards to that, um, I, was, I was deeply touched. Um, I think I, it will continue to accompany me in my thoughts um, for some time. This, 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 um, this idea of love being violent, um, I think we, I think it's safe to say that we have to sort of really think about what we say when we say love and what we what we mean when we say violent. Um, I think I think my my first reaction is in the sense that we're saying that love, it is only love that takes us out of ourselves, and it is only love that makes me see you as you and that involves that 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 action is is a rupture it's it's um it's a separation it's a distinguish it's um it's undoing myself from my expectations and in that sense it's 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 this destruction of of my expectations of the destruction of my ideas for you my 
the destruction of my fantasies for you. So in that sense, I can understand why it is why it is violent. Um, I don't know if you would like to elaborate briefly on on this idea of of love as violent. I would need another lecture in order to, <laughs> <laughs> to say what I have in my mind. <laughs> There's so many, so many ways of, of, of showing, you know, of, 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 of speaking about love. Um, for me, it is, it is a word that has to be forbidden. No one <laughs> has to be allowed to say that, you know, I love you, I love you. What, what would you, I love you. It's just, just uh, sub, submit you. I, I you know, uh, um, just, you know, uh, even, even, even in Trinitarian theology, you have the difficulties in this. What is that the father has a son? What is this? Um, uh, if you just, uh, if the father just, you know, calls the son a son, and the son is not allowed to call him father, hmm? you see how subtle things are. I had a uh, um, uh, disagreement with uh, John Gisulas, I was his assistant for years, but <laughs> now we have a certain disagreement on this uh, such points, you know. And one of the points uh, they are uh, asked, uh, what, do, what do we mean by it's just the father, the, no, the father, it's the monarch, the monarch. What, how dangerous is this? And that, you know, I give you life you the by his honor i give you the spirit okay but is there any reciprocity there commotion saves the reciprocity precisely this you know and of course in in, in the church the same thing and of course in the ontology of personhood we speak about ecstatic personhood what's ecstatic I have to work with this nature, but because it betrays me in every in, in my in my in, in my seconds in every second step, you know. I say that I love you, but nature says I don't love you. I use you, I fl flattering you. I use you as a narcissistic mirror. I um, uh, uh, create, you know, a, a series of wrong things about you and wrong stories about you. You know, the way we kill the other. Through the love, the way we give love are numerous, and uh, all these contain this element of, of, of love. Uh, the cold love, the cold love in this. In this, uh, mm. uh, yesterday, by accident, I I I, I listened. I heard this this old song by Pink Floyd, uh, "Mama," and the, from the wall. Mama will give you this. Mama will keep your baby like this. Mama will give you everything. I uh, create a girlfriend from you for you. I could, you know this, and, and this is love. And that's at the very best, uh, same moment is a suffocation. But Christ's love, one of our modern saints in Orthodox Church, Saint Paisius, I met him many times when he was alive. And he used to say that God's love is a king's love. You know, I mean, in, in the sense that it is a, a, a love which is very, 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 very subtle. He does not even allow us to understand that he loves us. He does not want to press us with love. He, he can makes something good for us and then he vanishes. And you doubt it, it was he or not. It was him or he was some, 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 something accidental. He hides himself all the time. Because for him, love is pure freedom. For us, usually, I can say only a phrase, love is pure slavery, usually. <laughs> and this is known also by psychology. And, uh, but, you know, the, the problem is that psychology cannot give solution. It's very subtle. Yeah. Um, um, I liked a lot when you talked about, uh, you mentioned divine will. And that phrase um, helped me to reflect a bit more. What about thinking uh, uh, about discernment as a process of uniting the divine will with the human will? 
or the human will that finds its dignity, real dignity in the divine will. I I I I lost two phrases, two two words that I'm not sure they understood. Can you repeat the the question? I don't know. Perhaps you, your your connection is not, not. Yes, it's not that good. From here, yeah, I try to. Um, uh, I heard about the term you mentioned. The term divine will, which is yes. very important, and I'm thinking just if we can uh, present the sermon as the uh, process of uniting the divine will with the human will or the human will that finds its true self in the divine will. Absolutely, but, but, but without losing its self. I mean, human stays a human is very important. We're not monophysite, it's not swallowed up. This is why I insist, I insist in the term that dialectical reciprocity. And when I, my first book was published in uh, in US, the Maximus the Confessors, uh, it called the Eucharistic Ontology, Maximus the Confessors, Eschatological Ontology of Dialogical Reciprocity. Some Protestant critics, critics said to me, what are you saying here? We are just obeying. We're not a relational automaton, you know. It's not an automatic. I, he speaks and he's God. What are you? You're nothing. He just imposes his will upon your will and his existence upon your existence. I don't want this. Is not to save me. It's not to, he, he, he abolishes me. He, I'm swallowed up. I, it's me. And that means that I, I want to, to be a pioneer of this will. I, I, I want you to understand this will. And this is why I'm struggling. And this is why we call ascesis, ascesis in, in our church. I mean, in both, in, in, in Christian church in general, mm -hmm. in order to assimilate this in my way and stay what I am and at the very same moment to be divinized, which, which is a miracle for me. And, yeah. and when the, what well, interesting, and when the human will as a human will, as you rightly say, protests as well against the divine will because it can't always understand the divine. How do you see that protest, lamenting, protesting of the human will uh, in, in its relationship, as you're saying, in this dialogical reciprocity with the divine will? It's wonderful. I like There's no sound. I think we lost again. Lost the connection, it seems. Um, okay, I think he's coming back. So I think he needs to reconnect. I think so. Um, let us see. Now here we have a we have a question from someone. I think we can we can explain it until he he comes in. So whether humans are incapable of, of pure love. Um, uh, when uh, saying that love is violent, but if we are creating the image of God, aren't we capable of love? That's precisely what he is advocating. And he's, he is um, uh, throwing light on uh, what generally we, uh, assume it is love, but in fact it is possession of the other or using of the other. So our 
the, the divine light, which gives us discernment, helps us and enables us to um, see the true nature of things and to see explicitly when love is love and love is being a manipulation of, of the other. So, um, and even a manipulation of, of myself. Uh, when I try to see myself, when, when I think I am loving, but in, the, in very fact, I am being egoistic and I'm being narcissistic, I'm being uh, perhaps a more um, uh, less, um, less aggressive term is love is vehement. Uh, okay, let's, let's say. Uh, so, did he manage to, to come back? <laughs> no, not yet. Okay. I think what he's saying, what he's saying is important, um, is very important because at the, the gist of all of this is that human transformation ultimately leads to freedom. Um, uh, interior freedom, it's um, it, the absolute freedom with, which God leaves us um, live by. Um, I think that that is, we cannot, we cannot really understand the extent of this, of this freedom, um, uh, precisely the extent of the extent of this love. Um, God, God doesn't project um, how do you say? God doesn't project um, uh, himself, or rather, he simply invites um, uh, or hides, rather, to 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 say what he you know what he was saying. God hides. Um, it's as if he puts out his hand and then hides. Um, this is uh, not just not just in the Orthodox Church, but it also obviously, as uh, as many of you know, this is very Carmelite um, uh, spirituality, which is very um, Oriental, very Eastern in its essence, um, spiritually. But I think we when we when we speak of God's providence, the providential hand of God, which is invisible, mm -hmm. uh, it's God gently loving us without even us noticing that God is doing so. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I really liked about this, this uh, talk is um, uh, this notion of, uh, because I, I've been dealing with it, uh, the issue of, in the West we speak about the imitation of Christ, to imitate Christ, as if Christ is someone who is outside of us. But here this, this beautiful expression, analogical identity. Um, uh, it, it shows and it reveals the fact that um, uh, I am partaker already of, of the life of Christ, I am partaker of, of divine life. So it's not something, it's not a, a process wherein I imitate someone who is outside of me and uh, uh, someone to whom I attach myself, like for example in, in, in the psychological theory of uh, Bowlby's, Bowlby's um, uh, attachment theory, for example, I attach myself to someone who is outside of me, but um, I am a partaker of this divine nature and therefore um, uh, imitation or whatever we call it, 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 it's possible because there is this analogical identity. So it's not just God out there who, um, uh, tells me to do this or to do, to do that or to act in this way or in, in another way. But it's, um, uh, it, it is possible because I see myself in God and God sees uh, the divine self in me. So it, it's very beautiful. And, and, and it, it, it breaks the narcissistic mirror because I see the other. I see, I see myself in the other. It's not the other way around. It's very beautiful. I think this this phrase, the analogical identity, um, his point is very important because it is it is, it, is, it is distinguished from consubstantial identity, uh -huh. um, um, and I think this is a very strong idea in the Orthodox Church and Orthodox spirituality. This idea of, in the essence, yes, we are consubstantial, 
um, we are of the same essence, homo usios, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but in our lived existence and uh, in our hypostasis, we are um, analogous. Um, our identity is analogous and it cannot be the same. So the, so again, freedom, difference, it is that difference that defines lived existence. And it is that difference which really marks the ethical, um, uh, the moral choices, the spiritual choices, the everyday choices that we live. It is, that, it is this, this tension between, in essence, being the same, but in actual life, being different and it is and it is um, fundamental that we work for this difference um, uh, I think I've always I've it's it's been long since I've been um, uh, reflecting on this I think difference scares us um, I think we want to I think this is a problem more in the um, Roman Catholic Church rather than in the Orthodox Church we want to, as as the West we want to Put structures. We want to, you know, um, make everyone fit into laws, into structures that we create, into terminologies that we have always used, and that we, you know, that make sense to us. Um, and perhaps this is something that the the world, how do you say, the unbelieving world, has moved on from. Um, um, you could see his his process from starting as a psychologist um, and psychoanalyst towards uh, pedagogy and philosophy and ultimately towards theology in his process it's not that he had left behind um, his work as you know his work in in human psychology but that was that is given that forms the basis of what he teaches but is then given a different horizon the, the I think I strongly believe that psychology alone, I agree with him that it describes, it gives us tools to know ourselves, to face ourselves, to distinguish very important um, identities, very important wounds, and it gives us tools to understand ourselves and distinguish ourselves from our you know, wounds, projections, ideas, etc. But ultimately, that is, this a description of who we are um, what tools do we does it give us the tool that psychology gives us is self-awareness very profound but then the the transcendent the the horizon towards more this 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 more um uh, of really um transforming who we are that is something that um uh, that theology gives us it's it's something that christ gives us um Hi, Father. We've been we've continued to discuss while we wait for you yeah. to connect. I lost my connection suddenly here. Uh, that's that's that was the problem. I don't know if this happens again, but it happens rarely. But sometimes, yes, it is. So uh, we can go on if you. I, I don't know if there is anyone else who would like um, to ask a question or as a comment. Yes, there's Claudio, it seems. Yes, Claudio. Thank you, Father Nicolaus, for this excellent um, work this morning. I, I really enjoyed listening to and learning at the same time. My question is about maybe you can um, help me in this area, in the sense that you, you spoke a lot about um, the approach, how we may discern better starting with humility what can the christian do when when in discerning when in the process of discernment um, he has not yet received what he what god would like him to to do after you know maybe a month or two or a year. Um, if I have not yet maybe understood God or if I understood him in the sense that how, how, what shall I do? Shall I continue to discern? Shall I continue, you know, unending year after year after year? But 
that, that's my, my question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there are good questions. Um, I think that um, as far as I understand, I, I, as I start uh, feeling gratitude, that this, this humility discernment starts automatically. As far as I manage to see, to, to, to feel this gratitude or friendship, you know, the problem is that we have learned to project our narcissism upon God, and asking, please do this in order to, I want to like you, but you have to do this first. <laughs> we use even God. <laughs> You see, uh, that happened in the ancient Greek religion uh, very much, and many Greek philosophers protested strongly against it. You use the gods. You use, you need the Aphrodite, you need the Jupiter, you need the, uh, you know, all, all gods because you need things from them. And you see, in, in, in Homer, Homer's, Homer's Odyssey, and, uh, Iliad, Iliad, you see gods fighting one, one against the other in order to please their, their fans. You know, we and, and 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 this is why you know uh, the ancient Greek religion could not be the religion of the philosophers. All the Greek philosophers are monotheists. Mm -hmm. the, the philosophical metaphysics, the Greek philosophical metaphysics, is monotheistic, strictly monotheistic. Precisely because of this, we tend to use God. God is the icon of the mother. You know, in, in, and this is true. So <laughs> I have this utilitarian relationship. Please bring me this. Make me a bishop. Make me a professor. And then, and then, and then, but when he makes me a professor or a, pre or a bishop or whatever, or a rich man, or whatever, I still want more because uh, desire is something unstoppable, is infinite. What I ask this moment is absolutely finite, but when I receive it, I ask for something more because the expression of, of, of human desire through the demands, and this is also Lacanian psychoanalysis again, cannot be fully expressed. The desire is without object. It is wonderful that um, Lacan discovered that without object, we have the absolute object. We don't know what we, need, what we want. It's very vast, the, the, the object, the final object of, of desire is hidden. So uh, I could say very briefly, we have stopped using God. Uh, in uh, another book of mine, a Greek book of mine, I wrote this phrase, we have start seeing God in his eyes, not in his heads. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then another sort of relation starts, and then, and then comes time, the time of, of, of gratitude. Strangely now, not when we expect him to give something, but we get, we, 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 we stop expecting us, you know, uh, we stop expecting him to, to give us something, this and this and this. And then we realize what we had. We see a man who is now ill in the hospital, it's, it feels uh, very strong gratitude to God because he realizes what he had before. When he was healthy, he couldn't realize what it is to be healthy. Now he's in the hospital and he feels gratitude. And he says that I'm wonderful now. I feel much, much, I'm happy. I'm happy this moment. I'm happy this moment. Because precisely because, you know, he realizes he starts looking God in the eyes now because he does not want, he, can, he cannot have what he, he needs in his hands. Uh, may yeah. I? Yes, yes. Th thank you, Professor, for, for this beautiful um, and insightful uh, session. I really, I really loved your, your expression, analogical identity. Uh, yeah. uh, which for a Catholic mindset um, uh, rings very beautifully um, uh, and expands um, uh, what we usually on a popular level, we speak always um, meditation, 
uh, but, but here we have, as if we are imitating someone who is outside of us, but here an analogical identity, it's a very beautiful, it renders the idea that the truth that um, uh, I am partaker of, of, of divine life. So um, I'm not imitating someone who is outside of me, but the other, in the other, I see myself and, and God sees um, himself, we might say so, in, in, in me. So, so, so there's this, this beautiful, thank, thank you for the expression. I really, it was a blessing. Um, uh, what what um, uh, I, I, it came to my mind also, um, connected to the analogical identity, it's more deeper than, for example, some psychological theories, um, um, like theories of attachment, like Bowlby's, Bowlby's attachment theory. Um, so here we are, this is much more deeper, it's much more realistic, it's much more truthful to, 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 uh, for the growth of the person. I don't know if you, if you wish to elaborate. This, 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 you said the, this attachment. Yes, the attachment, the, the, this, the, the psychological theories of attachment, where we act in certain ways because we attach ourselves to a mother figure, to mother, to, to the parent, to uh, someone who is uh, greater than us. I, I feel that this analogical identity, identity is much more deeper and it, it's more, more, much more realistic and gives salvation, actually. Uh, look, uh, thank you for this. Um, uh, uh, in, the, in the in the Greek East, I uh, in this book I speak of the one mm -hmm. Greek Western Christian world. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to move beyond East West. East West, West is nothing. You know, for example, the last chapter of this book is called "An Aquinas for the Future." Mm -hmm. You see, that means that we have to uh, understand that we live in, 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 in the same world. And, you know, for example, if you put Thomas Aquinas and Gregorio Palamas, Gregorio Palamas together, they, they would have to discuss a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they, they're very important convergences, not only divergences, because I, I, I call this cultural wars, cultural wars. The Latinist, the Byzantine, the Greek West, which is, you know, it, even in those time, periods of time, did not, it was not absolutely clear. No one thinks that I am a Greek with no, and, then, and, and therefore I have to fight against the one who holds the flag of the Latinists. These are silly things, you know. For example, in this book, I, 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 I have some disagreements with uh, Augustine here and there, but I, 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 I am proving that that happened because Augustine was or, or, or originist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this started from Oregon, not from Augustine. I want to say, after making this uh, little, uh, introduction, is that the uh, notion of concept of analogy in the Areopagite and Maximus are connected also with synergy. This is what the, the Areopagite said, that it belongs to our common tradition. The analogy, that means synergy or synergy. And analogy means that not only that uh, you have, uh, shall I say, uh, a little car and a very, very big car, an energy of essence. But it's an energy of energy. That means what I'm doing now and you're doing now. I'm trying to explain, my, to explain myself, mm -hmm. energy, and you're trying to understand and go on synergy. You see, this is an, an analogical existence yes. we have now. You know, and, 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 and in this sense, this identity is an open identity because it, you know, it suddenly creates a, a, a great horizon. Everything that is divine can enter my poor self. Good, you know, and, and, and that, that means that I can participate. I have uh, the sanctification in this body, body in, the, in this soul, you know, not just as something that I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. This is why Gregory Palamas made a very sharp contradistinction between contemplating God and being in communion with God. Mm -hmm. Contemplation of God is something that also Heraclitus, I love very much Heraclitus, he saved me when I was an atheist. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I have written many things about Heraclitus. <laughs> Just, no, this is precisely the difference. 
if he could hear. And uh, one of my, the chapters of, 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 the, of my new book is called Analogical Ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Analogical Ecstasy. That means we have both, you know, in, 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 in Plotinus, the one speaks. Mm -hmm. You're dancing around him, but he does not want you. He doesn't like you. He, 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 he does not care a penny for you. In Heidegger, you speak, the, the being speaks, but it's called parallel ecstasies. You know, monological ecstasies, parallel ecstasies, dialogical ecstasy, which is wonderful. He speaks, he explains. He's a good father. He, I was in a monastery in France some uh, three years ago, and uh, an Orthodox monastery. And I was the question, uh, some man, nuns put me the question, how is God seeing, how is he, is he seeing us? And I answered, as babies. Mm. He's playing, he's playing with us, playing in the good sense, but he's very serious. As a good father who's playing with his baby, but he's very serious about his, uh, his things and his, his thoughts and wills about him. So this is synergy. See, I mean, this is analogy, the analogy of, 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 which is very close to this um, um, uh, concept of acting together, asking, uh, receiving uh, 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 responses, not being able to understand them, asking again, and being given explanations, you know, and, 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 and this forms uh, a way of working together with Christ, you know, working together, working together. So I don't know if, yes, you know, this is all, the will of God. All your questions are very good, and I'm really grateful about this. And this is the, the will of God. Uh, because sometimes yeah. we, tend to, um, uh, we tend to see the will of God as um, discerning to do this and avoid that and uh, to be this and to be that. Well, when it's the will of God, is this analogical identity, this synergy. Let's make a, thank you very much for this. Let's make a parenthesis. I'm a member of, of the dialogue with the Catholic Church. And I was for four, 15 years the, the, the Orthodox secretary of the academic dialogue. The, the, this is this Saint Irenaeus working group, which is the only, you know. I, I said many things that if we want to speak about unity between the, the two churches, perhaps the way is what we uh, falsely or uh, correctly would call spirituality. You know. You have two groups of theologians discussing about, uh, say, the primacy or about the filio. Mm -hmm. And then no one of them wants to just listen to himself and said, prepares his, 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 his next, you know, arguments. You know, I'm blah, 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 blah. He says that, I'm going, no, this, this can lead to an impasse. But when we speak about the existential needs that we have, you know, the practical Christian life, which is not the life, it's, 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 it's what we all need finally. Both theologians and I, the priests and the bishops, the monks and the civil you know, human beings. This is what we, I mean, and, and then we uh, understand what the mystery of Christian life, life is. And then we can overcome the cultural wars of the past. It's very important for to overcome the cultural wars of the past. And then we see what uh, each one of us has to give to the other as a gift, then, not as an opposition. I have to give you the gift of this gift and the other gift. Sorry for this parenthesis. I am uh, an academic theologian and I'm involved in all of this. But uh, each time I, I think sometimes that it's a, a way of losing our time. Losing our time. Although we have this approach, of, you know, it's thankful, thank God for this. Uh, over the last decades, say yes, please. If, uh, it's very, is there anyone else? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure we have a comment. How do we? I think we yes. Uh, we we answered Mario's. Father Mario's question, no, with this is work from before. Okay. Um, unfortunately, our time, our time is up. <laughs> um, 
But I think it's been it's been a wonderful reflection, Father um, Nicholas, that you led us in. I really thank you for the work that you do, that you that you accepted our invitation. Um, I thank everyone also for for being with us. Um, we had also um, colleagues from University of Malta with us, um, students, our colleagues from the Priory, Carmelite Priory in Medina. Um, thank you all for this. It's. Um, I hope we can. This is the start of something, a long process of sort of collaborating and um, yeah. getting to know each other, um, getting to know the you know each other through this this grassroots level. Um, I am a firm believer that dialogue starts you know with with concrete faces and, um, and sharing you know the spiritual life together and spiritual ideas together. So thank you very much for that. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, the um, the the a whole record the whole recording can be found on on facebook for those who would like um however those who would like to have a let me ask you is it going to be put also in youtube we if you if you would like i can i can, I I can manage that indeed. yeah i would like okay. this very much okay it was a very good discussion i will i'm also grateful that i said this okay Father Glenn also told me that you have the, your elections today. Yes, yes. Well, I wish you also political discernment. <laughs> As well, yes. <laughs> That's Thank the you joke. Some people went, went to vote before, not to be influenced by discernment and change their mind <laughs> before the talk. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Father Shalom. Thank you, too. I'm going to vote now to being enlightened by the, the, the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you too. Thank you, everyone. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao. Thank you.